Stadium. Stadium. The episode's dropping on Mondays. It's the man, it's the man, watch that. It's the man, it's the man, watch that. It's the man, it's the man, watch that podcast. And welcome to the Matt Watch That Podcast, the place for reviews, rants, and randomness. I'm your host, Matt Sarosky, filmmaker, film fan. Each episode, I'm going to watch a movie or TV pilot that I probably should have seen but never got around to. It could be a recent favorite, critic's choice, or cult classic. Everyone can join in on the fun. Follow me on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook, at Matt Sarosky. You can subscribe to my YouTube page where I'll post videos and clips from the show. If you have any opinions on what I've discussed or suggestions as to what I should see next, use the hashtag MattWatchThat on social. Before we start, this coming Friday is Veterans Day, so I wanted to extend a heartfelt thank you to all those who have served to defend this country. I would also encourage everyone to go out and vote tomorrow for candidates who will uphold the democracy that these brave men and women fought for. With that being said, I do want to go on a bit of a tangent, but it will come back to people who've served. Recently, Aaron Judge broke the American League's single-season home run record with 62. It was previously held by Roger Maris, who hit 61 home runs in 1961. How apropos. Now, baseball historians are trying to put it all in perspective. Is Aaron Judge the single-season home run record holder? No, he's not. He hasn't hit the most home runs in a season. That belongs to Barry Bonds. Sorry, people. This is reality. You see, baseball has become a numbers game, almost ad nauseum. I think there are a bunch of nerds out there trying to justify their jobs, so they keep coming up with different ways to crunch the numbers. It's like when a movie opens up at number four, but the advertisements say, it was number one at the box office for a horror movie released on a holiday weekend with an odd number day. Like, how many parameters can you give it, man? But the reason I mention this is because I don't think you can always compare numbers, especially in baseball. There are so many variables. How do you compare two players' statistics when one played a 140-game schedule and another played 162? I mean, are you going to estimate what the stats would be in those differential 22 games? And that brings me to players who competed in the 1940s, many of whom lost time due to service in World War II. In the Army, you had Joe DiMaggio, Warren Spahn. In the Navy, Bob Feller, Pee Wee Reese, Phil Rizzuto, and Stan Musial. In the Marines, Gil Hodges and Ted Williams. One of the greatest hitters in baseball could have easily gotten over 3,000 hits. And he had just come off winning the Triple Crown. After joining the United States Navy Reserve and being commissioned for the Marines, he returned to baseball and earned the American League MVP, the Triple Crown in 1947, and another MVP in 1949. He returned to service in the Marines in 1952 for the Korean War, which Whitey Ford and Willie Mays served as well. I mean, this was in their prime. How can you compare the statistics of people who have served with those who didn't have an interrupted career? Just imagine if you took three years out of Bryce Harper or Mike Trout's career. How would their numbers be affected in the overall baseball pantheon? And look at all the errors that we've had. The dead ball era, the live ball era, the expansion era, the steroid era. And how do you even compare players when the sport wasn't integrated? Anyone can manipulate numbers to fit their narrative. But ultimately, like everything in life, you have to put those numbers in context. So it would be wonderful if we could straight up compare past players to present players. But baseball has evolved. And I think that the way that we use and compare stats need to evolve as well. On to the main attraction. Each review will end with a ranking out of five stars. One star is skip it. Two stars watch at your own risk. Three stars standard fare. Four stars worth checking out. And five stars must see. Now, if I give a title five stars, it doesn't mean I'm comparing it to Casablanca, Jaws, or Seinfeld. I rank titles based on other movies or TV series in that genre and at that time period. So let's jump into it. These are my ruminations and observations of the movie Coal Miner's Daughter from 1980. So how'd I miss it? Well, I used to work at AMC when it was known as American Movie Classics, and we would play this film constantly. So I'm not walking into this blind but I've never really seen it right through from beginning to end, and I don't know much about Loretta Lynn's life, so this will be an interesting watch. 
It was directed by Michael Apted, who helmed Gorillas in the Mist, Nell, The World is Not Enough, and Enough. The screenplay was written by Thomas Rickman, who scribed The Laughing Policeman, The River Rat, Hooper, and the TV movie Tuesdays with Maury. It was based on the autobiography, co-written by Loretta Lynn, with George Vexy. The movie stars Sissy Spacek as Loretta Lynn. A lot of alliteration there. She was born and raised in Texas and aspired to be a singer, recording a single, John You Went Too Far This Time, in 1968. She would enroll in the Lee Strasberg Theater and Film Institute and work as a model for Andy Warhol's factory. She would move to New York and be accepted into Lee Strasberg's actor's studio with the help of her cousin, Rip Torn. Her breakthrough role was in Terrence Malick's Badlands, where she earned critical acclaim. This would lead to parts in Carrie, Raggedy Man, The River, Crimes of the Heart, and JFK. She's been nominated for six Academy Awards for Best Actress in a Leading Role, winning one for this movie. Tommy Lee Jones portrays Doolittle Lynn, another native of Texas. He attended Harvard College and was roommates with Al Gore. He graduated with a degree in English and soon moved to New York to pursue acting. He made his Broadway debut in A Patriot for Me and soon landed his first film role in Love Story. He would bounce between plays and television appearances, winning an Emmy for Best Actor in The Executioner's Song. The 90s saw his star rise with roles in JFK, The Fugitive, The Client, Natural Born Killers, Batman Forever, and Men in Black. This is something to look out for. The concert scenes were filmed at Ryman Auditorium in Nashville, which served as the home of the Grand Old Opry for 30 years. The movie starts with 14-year-old Loretta and her younger brother Herman visiting their father, Ted Webb, at the Van Leer coal mines. She's intrigued by a strapping army man named Doolittle Lynn, who drives a red jeep. They watch as he tries to show off, navigating the vehicle up a steep pile on a dare. He stands at the top of the heap, victorious, as Loretta cheers him on. They return to their home, a small shack in Butcher Hollow, Kentucky. Mother Clara Marie takes care of the eight children. Even though they can't afford much, father has packages for the family, new sets of shoes. Loretta gets an extra item, a pretty dress because she's growing up and needs to have nice things. At a pie social, yes, those are a thing apparently, Doolittle auctions a chocolate pie made by Loretta and makes a bid on it himself. Later, he offers to walk her home and they flirt. He kisses her goodnight before leaving. The next morning, he brings the jeep around and they go riding through town. She comes home late and is punished by her father. Loretta declares that she's in love with him, but Ted doesn't want her hanging around with him. When Doolittle visits the house, he asks for permission from her parents and proposes to Loretta. They get married the next day and spend their honeymoon in a motel. They move in together and cracks in the relationship start to show. When he comes home from the coal mines, they have an argument and he kicks her out of the house. She goes back to live with her parents and while in town, she finds him flirting with another woman. Loretta tells him that she's pregnant. Doolittle informs her that he's leaving for Washington and going to get a job on a ranch. He expects her to come along with him and will send money for a train ticket. Loretta moves to Washington and a few years later, they're living the domestic life with four children. For an anniversary present, Doolittle gets her an acoustic guitar because he likes the way she sings. He sets up an audition for her to sing at a local honky-tonk, and she shows hesitance, not wanting to perform in front of strangers. Loretta passes the audition and has her first live performance the next week, knocking it out of the park. They decide to go into the studio to record an album, take flattering photographs, and send out the packages to country music stations. After she learns her father died, they take the children back to Kentucky and leave them with her mother as Loretta and Doolittle tour the country radio stations in the area to promote her album. They visit WCBL and confront the disc jockey about not playing her song, Honky Tonk Girl, badgering him until he interviews Loretta and spins her record. After making stops at other radio stations, they're informed that their song has reached number 14 nationwide. Their next stop is the Grand Ole Opry. Here's a quote without context. He sure went to a lot of trouble to get on top of a pile of nothing. Coal Miner's daughter was entertaining enough, but I wasn't taken by the film. The pacing was a little off. The first hour focuses on her home life. Then the next 30 minutes shows her rise to stardom. But there isn't much conflict there. So you're just watching this person's life get better and better. Then the marriage starts to go through some rough patches as her star rises. I think the issue with autobiographical movies is that I'm more interested in the behind the scenes of a person's life when they're in the public eye. 
What really happened? What inspired that song? While it is fascinating to watch the journey of someone raised in poverty get to the heights of fame and fortune, I still wanted to get to the career faster. Spending an hour getting to that point is a little tedious. This doesn't take away from the performances. Sissy Spacek is phenomenal acting as Loretta Lynn starting at the age of 14. You can see the arc of an insecure teenager into a confident young woman. Tommy Lee Jones does a great job balancing determination and disappointment. I do want to give a shout out to Beverly D'Angelo who played Patsy Cline. I know her mostly from the National Lampoon comedies, so to watch her in a different role, especially one where she's dramatic in singing, was definitely impressive. Now for a little trivial trivia. At the 53rd Academy Awards, both the Best Actor and Best Actress Awards went to Robert De Niro and Sissy Spacek for their portrayals of real-life people. What made the event even more unique was that Jake LaMotta and Loretta Lynn were both in attendance. The cinematography was captured by Ralph D. Bodie, whose filmography includes Dress to Kill, The Accused, Cousins, Uncle Buck, and Made in America. It was edited by Arthur Schmidt, who worked on Jaws 2, the Back to the Future trilogy, The Rocketeer, The Birdcage, Primary Colors, and won two Academy Awards for Best Film Editing of Who Framed Roger Rabbit and Forrest Gump. There was no traditional score. The soundtrack featured songs of Loretta Lynn and Patsy Cline performed by the actors. These include Blue Moon of Kentucky, There He Goes, Walking After Midnight, and Crazy. I'll admit, I got tired of hearing Honky Tonk Girl after a while because it was the only song she'd written, so it was performed at least 10 to 20 times in the first half of the movie. But luckily, as her profile rises, there's a variety of songs, so you really get to hear her catalog. The runtime is 2 hours 4 minutes. It had a budget of 15 million and grossed 67 million at the box office. It was nominated for seven Oscars at the 1981 Academy Awards, Best Film Editing, Best Sound, Best Art Direction, Best Cinematography, Best Writing, Screenplay Based on Material from Another Medium, Best Picture, and Winning for Best Actress in a Leading Role. I give it 3.75 out of 5 stars. If you've seen Coal Miner's Daughter and have opinions on the movie, let me know what you think using the hashtag MattWatchThat. Moving right along. Each episode, I'm going to post clips that I think people should watch. It could be movie trailers, music videos, interviews, or something completely random. Search for my YouTube page and there will be a playlist called Matt Watch That Playback. I'm not sure how this trend started, but a few years ago, I came across a couple of music videos that were overdubbed, with the lyrics being replaced with a narrative of the action that's appearing in the music video. It's called Literal Videos. There's a user on YouTube called Dusto McNito who posted a couple of them, but I'm not sure if he's the originator because there are more floating around. But either way, they're pretty funny because not only do they describe the action, it still works within the context and the rhythm of the song. I think it was probably inspired by pop-up video. It was around that time where stations were doing anything to try and make music videos relevant, even though it was a dying art. I've selected four for your enjoyment. Head Over Heels by Tears for Fears, Take On Me by AHA, Total Eclipse of the Heart by Bonnie Tyler, and The Safety Dance, Men Without Hats. They're all available in the Matt Watch That Playback playlist on YouTube. Check it out. Now it's time for the recommendation. Yes, that's the word recommendation with Matt in the middle. I'm going to end each podcast with my own recommendation of a movie or TV series. Today I'm talking about The Joy of Painting. This was a program presented by Bob Ross, where he gave step-by-step -step instructions to show the wet-on-wet -wet techniques to create beautiful oil paintings in 30 minutes. There were accompanying videos and booklets that you could purchase to do paintings at your own pace. My family would tape the episodes off of PBS and had much of the equipment and materials to do painting. During the summer, my family would break out the easels, put on the canvas, do the thin layer of liquid white, and paint some happy little clouds and mighty trees. I have to admit, I was a pretty good little painter. I started when I was seven years old and made some pretty convincing replicas of Bob Ross paintings. Although I could never conquer mountains. I wasn't good with the knife, and you had to have the lightest touch to make the paint break for it to look like snow. Mine looked more like avalanches, so I usually avoided those landscapes. 
the one thing I never got to do was to paint with black gesso because that looked like a lot of fun. He always did seascapes with crashing waves. They looked awesome at the end. And if I had any room, I'd probably get back into it. But then you have the problem of what do I do with these paintings? Because if you do 10, do you really have enough wall space to put them all up? And then it is kind of egotistical, like, look what I did. Anyway, he had a pretty fascinating life, most of which was captured in the documentaries Bob Ross the Happy Painter on PBS and Bob Ross Happy Accidents, Betrayal, and Greed on Netflix. He spent 20 years in the United States Air Force, rising to the rank of Master Sergeant, he was required to use a powerful voice to give commands, and was in charge of disciplining soldiers in his troop. Once he left, however, he vowed never to raise his voice, which is why on the show, he uses dulcet tones similar to Mr. Rogers. He passed away on July 4th, 1995, due to complications from lymphoma. He was 52. The Joy of Painting was on for 31 seasons, 403 episodes, from 1983 to 1994. It continues to air on PBS affiliates and is streaming on Freevee, Tubi, Pluto TV, YouTube, and Cineverse. That's all for this edition of Matt Watch That. Thanks for listening to me babble. You can follow me on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook at Matt Sarosky. You can subscribe to my YouTube page where I'll post videos and clips from the show. If you have any opinions on what I've discussed or suggestions as to what movie or TV pilot I should see, use the hashtag MattWatchThat on social. Head over to MattSaroski.com for the latest news and updates, and come back next time for the reviews, rants, and randomness. She would move to New York and be accepted into Lee Asperg's They return to their home, a small shack in Butcher Hollow, Carolina. Nope.